And uh, in case I forget this illustration later, I, I just think I'll give it now. Uh, I think the Lord gave me some convictions, and then I tried to search the Word. And I remember one time when our son was, I think he was 16, and uh, we were on our way to camp meeting. We didn't have far to go, just were walking. And he, he'd been for some days just, uh, he wasn't saved, he was just mean to his little sister. And he did something that was uh, pretty unkind to her. I don't know what it was now, but uh, hurt her till she cried. And I felt like it was more my duty to handle that than it was to walk on to camp meeting. So I just told him, I said, we're going back to the house. And we went back to the house and went to his room and I talked to him and I told him what he'd done that was wrong and the attitude he'd been showing and that the scripture required of me that I punish him for it. And uh, then I prayed with him. And uh, as I prayed, I prayed that the Lord would help me to give him a good spanking. And, uh, uh, and I know that 16 years old is too old to get a spanking. But I prayed that the Lord would help me to give him a good spanking, and believe me, the Lord answered prayer. He, uh, he, got, a, he got a good spanking. Well, you like to know the results of it? it? That didn't save him, but it so turned him around that his teachers thought he got saved. He acted like a saved person for a long time until God, God got his grace to his heart. And so, just tell you those little stories in case I don't get to them later. Would you strain yourself to listen to me this morning speaking on something, as Brother Shmuel uses that big word, mundane. I'll look that up in the dictionary when I get home so I know for sure what it is. I got a good idea, though. I want to read you the scripture. Deuteronomy 6, just a few verses, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Now, again, lest I should fail to mention this later that I'd like to, I'd like to have you notice something in those first few verses that I read. The first one is, get your theology straight. Now, that's, that's good advice, even to homeless people. Here's good theology. The Lord our God is one Lord. Be sure you're sound in your doctrine. And then be sure that you're sound in your experience. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee shall be in thine heart. So have sound theology, have a sound experience, and then have sound biblical practice. Bring up your home in the way that God wants it to be brought up. I suppose that I am liable this morning to give you about 12 points and then about 14 and then about five and then about seven or something like that. So don't, don't try and hold me down to anything too definite, please. But I'd like to give you what I've written up and have called 12 laws for saving our children. And I believe the first one is more important than we often realize. Keep love strong and holy in your marriage. That's, that's one of the biggest rules there is. Keep love strong and holy in your marriage. God performed the first marriage when he gave Eve to Adam to be in help meet, sent them out to live for him, and Jesus Christ blessed the first wedding at Cana of Galilee, and both the Old and New Testaments have much to say about what our marriage ought to be. 
And I'm, I, I want to try and get over a lot this morning, so I may touch on some things lightly. But let me give you about four things that will help to keep that love strong and holy in your marriage. Show appreciation for one another. Uh, you know, it's one thing to show it, and uh, you know, it's another thing to have it. And maybe some people have appreciation for their companion without ever showing it, but, but you ought to show it. You ought to help one another. Until my health was so serious as it is, I helped my wife run the vacuum cleaner, and I helped do the dishes, and I helped keep the house up. And you say, isn't that a woman's work? Well, sure it is. But sometimes uh, you can help to show your love in practical ways. I read about one man that said if he had his life to live over again, there were some things that he would do differently. And one of them, he said he wouldn't pray as much for his wife. Well, that shocked me when I read it until I went on to get uh, kind of what he was getting at. And about what it amounted to was this. Uh, let's say, um, uh, this is my own illustration, but it illustrates the point that he had. Uh, let's say that they had a busy morning, but they're going on a picnic that afternoon. And the man sees very well that his wife has got a handful getting the house straightened up and the lunch packed and so on. And he says, my wife's just going to be overwhelmed with work. I think I'm going to slip away in my study and pray for her, that the Lord will give her strength to get that housework done and uh, get that lunch packed and, and get the children ready and everything else. No, don't pray for her. Pitch in and help. That's, that's far better. And you know, I, I believe you can keep your courtship love alive. Uh, my wife showed me just not too long ago the vase in which I gave her 25 roses on our 25th wedding anniversary. She prizes that. I prize it that she appreciates that. So you can keep courtship love alive. Remind one another of it once in a while. I, I've been very impressed. I, uh, I can't help but be impressed. I, I go away from home quite a bit. And almost every time I unpack my suitcase, there'll be a little note from my wife telling me, you know, that she missed me and she'll be praying for me and be glad when I get home. And, and that, that's a whole lot better than what I saw one woman do one day. She'd been away on a trip, and I don't know who was the worst off, she or her husband. But when she got home, she looked in the face and said, well, I suppose you're sorry I'm back. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's no, no way to get along. I've noticed that uh, my dear wife, bless her heart, uh, she'll uh, listen to me through the year, you know, something that I seem to want, and, and uh, I'll probably have that for my birthday or Christmas. I remember one time she got me a big $30 uh, Greek uh, a book, and uh, I really appreciated that. And I try to reciprocate one time for Christmas. I got her a commentary written by a Greek scholar. <laughs> so, you know, try to try to do those little things that uh, that can mean, mean a lot. And uh, I remember one time a wife and I. Uh, this again is keeping courtship love alive. I remember one time we were taking a little trip with an elderly woman, and she and her husband had just had their golden wedding anniversary. And uh, we, we were their pastors, just first pastor and very young. And, and we took her along with us for some reason, I don't know. She was a Christian member of the church. The, her husband never went to church. And just to make conversation, I said to her, I said, do you like to travel? She said, oh, I just love to travel. And uh, then I said, uh, uh, does your husband like to travel? And she kind of hesitated in a moment, and she said, well, I, I don't know whether he does or not. And I said to myself, woman, you haven't been married for 50 years yet. She, if she didn't know what her husband liked after 50 years, there was something wrong there. My, my wife knows a good share of my peculiarities, such as... Uh, I won't tell you that because they're so peculiar. <laughs> She's going to let it go, but then she knows what they are. A second law for helping to save your children is make your home as attractive as possible. And you don't need to have lots of money to do that. It's perfectly possible to keep your home attractive. I know a young girl who is 
Uh, she's at that age where she ought to be rightly having some boyfriends to call on her. And at least she ought to be having some girlfriends in to visit her. And their house comes so close to looking like they were either moving in or moving out or ought to have a bulldozer go through it to clean it. And that girl not too long ago said to her mother, she said, I wish that our house looked nice enough so I could invite my friends. Make, make, make your home just as attractive as you can. And uh, uh, you know they say one classification of mothers is, uh, you know when that little boy of yours comes in with a bunch of dandelions clasped in his hand, there's two kinds of mothers. One will put them in a milk bottle on top of the refrigerator, and the other will put them in a vase on top of the piano. <laughs> There's a little difference. Make home just as attractive as you possibly can. I think that a woman especially ought to learn to sew and decorate and know how to hang pictures and know to, how to keep the house attractive. I've told this story a few times, but it's an interesting one to me. We've had some interesting uh, things in our journey through our married life so far. And uh, one time, because of some circumstances, uh, I hope you won't look down on me or my wife because of this, but because of circumstances, uh, the only place we had to live was in a big refrigerator truck box. It was off the wheels, it was on the ground, and, and we lived in it. And, uh, and I'd like to tell you this, my wife made that old truck box attractive. Uh, she made the, chill, the little children's beds on top of the wheel housing, and it was clean. We had good meals there, and, and everything was clean. But the uh, amusing thing about it was a woman came to visit us one day who was a... She didn't know what the idea of housekeeping meant. She just... I mean, her house was... Uh, let, let's say no more. Draw the curtain of charity over that picture. But... <laughs> She came into our truck box house, and she said, and it looked nice. My wife, you know, a woman that can, can make a home with a poor place. And that place looked poor. It was poor, but it looked so nice that this other woman said, when you folks move out of here, I want to move in. <laughs> well, she it had been the same old junk house that she'd lived in before. And so make your home as attractive as possible. And that's not unchristian to make your home attractive. If you can afford pretty flowers and pretty pictures and good books and, and good music in the home, you do it. But make your home as attractive as, a, as possible. Let me give you another one of these laws for saving your children. Accept God's order of authority. And no matter what the modern view is, that order absolutely is the man is the head of the house. He's not the boss of everybody, but he's the head of the house. And his wife carries out orders under him, but in love. And the man loves his wife, and the wife submits to her husband, and the children obey their parents. And it will help the children to get saved if you accept God's order of authority. I, I've, I haven't had a lot of experience, but at least I've lived a little while yet. And I know of one case where the woman continually contradicted her husband's orders to the children. She, she would all, I, I believe she would almost fight to have her way. Not with those little differences, you know, that a man and woman might have different opinions, but she just totally defended those children to the extreme. And uh, she has two daughters that it looks like, uh, it, uh, that is in my not too humble opinion, are headed for trouble, probably the reform school or the penitentiary. And I think a part of it is because God's order of authority was not accepted in that home. And let me say this especially to preachers. Make your home Christian all the way through, all the way through. Don't preach a glorious gospel and have your boys wrestling in the aisle and tearing up the rug. I hope they know too much to do it in their teens, but they oughtn't to do it when they're little either. You can, you can take care of those things, absolutely. It's your, it's your God-given responsibility. 
I remember one time this really paid us off. Our youngest daughter was, was backslidden. I hope she'll be here to this camp maybe before it's over. She's just a little girl, but she had learned to obey her parents. And one time in a revival, and I say she was just a little girl, but you know how often children are rebellious, they won't move when the altar call's given. And the altar call was given, she was standing next to the aisle, and I saw my wife slip away from the front seat, go around, come back of her, and she just touched her hand to her shoulder. And my daughter just broke and ran for the altar. She was used to obeying her mother. It wasn't hard for an divine God. And she's a Christian worker today. I thank God for that. Let me give you a fourth law for saving your children, and that is pray with and pray for your children. You need to do both. And, and I, 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 like to, I hope I'm not too far off the track on this, but I don't really believe that family worship with little children or uh, prayer times with little children ought to run into the long sessions of time. I don't believe they ought to. I believe that there can be a little song that they can sing or a Bible, Bible verse that they can give and uh, maybe let them take turns praying or father or mother pray or sometimes. But it can be simple, but, but there needs to be prayer. I, I knew a, a good man, one of the best men I ever knew, but he had a family of small children uh, uh, the two older girls were, I believe, in college, but it went on down to about, oh, I suppose about second grade. But that dear man, he, uh, he didn't know Brother Smule, but he was trying to be Wesleyan like Brother Smule is. And he required those little children to read John Wesley's sermons. <laughs> That's too much, isn't it, Brother Smooth? <laughs> that's too much. I tell you, I've read them over and over, but th that, that's a little bit heavy. I think you better read them, Hurlbut's uh, stories of the Bible, and a few simple verses and a few simple songs, and make it a happy time for the children. I believe that you can do that. Let me give you a fifth law for saving your children, and that is faithful church attendance. And I believe that that ought to be faithful. I, I happened to pastor for a short while a couple who grew up in radically different homes. The girl, the wife, had grown up in a home where they went to church every Sunday and every prayer meeting. That, that's just the way they did it. Her husband grew up in a home where his parents said, well, if you want to go to church, all right. If you don't, all right. And most of the time, he didn't go to church. Well, you know what happened? The time came when they weren't pulling together. He was professing religion, but not, not very good. And the time came where it was easy for him to miss church. And then he was laying out of church a good deal more than he was being there. And finally, the time came when he wasn't going at all. And the next thing, he was keeping his wife out of church. And the next thing, they'd gone to a worldly church. I saw her the other day. Her hair is cut. Her dress isn't the modest Christian dress she used to wear. But faithful church attendance is an important thing. I, I believe that scripture is serious. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And, and uh, again, let me, let me just touch some of these things quickly. If you have a number of relatives come in on Sunday and a big meal seems the thing to do and they won't go to church with you, they, they don't go to church, the thing for you to do is say, here's some good books and here's some music and you can look at it and we'll be back after church and have dinner. Don't stay home with, otherwise they're convinced that their visit is more important than your worshiping God in your church. Don't, don't, don't stay away from church for your relatives, no matter what they are. And maybe I'm getting a little bit extreme here, and I don't know where the age is, but I believe that you should require your children to give attention in church. I believe you should require it. When our boy was too little to understand what was going on, my wife just had the practice of saying, watch the preacher. And I guess he thought that was his duty and you could see him move back and forth when people got in front. He watched the preacher. Well, that's better than cutting up. 
And uh, I'll tell you where I got some of my convictions about how people ought to behave in church. And that is, I was an usher in church while I was a student in Bible school, and I worked my way through school as a janitor. And believe me, I got tired of sweeping up cracker crumbs and cookie crumbs and picking up torn songbooks that, so, why, their children got to have something to play with. Well, here's a church songbook. Play with it. And they, they played with it. And they drew on, drew on it with their Crayolas. I said, if I ever get married and have children, they won't do that. And believe you me, they didn't. Not a one of them. Not one time. They didn't do that. I believe that you can require the children's attention in church. And there's no use of telling people this at this camp because you can't do it. But in the average church, if you can, sit toward the front. And I think, depending on their, their age, now here's this old fogey old grandfather talking, but depending on their age, I think they either ought to sit with you or in the pew in front of you, but not way back of you. Now, that's what I really think. We brought our children up on the second seat from the front. That's where we brought up our children. And you can, now I'm not saying do that here at camp meeting because we just simply wouldn't make it here. But uh, keep your children with you and see that they behave. We had a habit of when we got home for dinner after church, we'd ask the children, uh, who sang the special this morning? What did the preacher preach about? And things like that, until it just kind of fixed it in their minds that they were supposed to try and pay attention and remember things in church. And again, like I say, when you get old and kind of uh, poor in your thinking, you, you don't know maybe a lot of things like you ought to. And I don't know where the, the rule is of bringing up children about letting them run in and out of church. Uh, I know what we did. Uh, we tried to take care of some things before church and they stayed in church till service was over. That's what we did. But I suppose every time I think of that, and I've told this story a dozen times, but if you haven't heard it, you, you just need to hear it. It's worth hearing. H.C. Morrison tells the story. If you've all heard it, raise your hand and I'll go with something else. Oh, you have no. Well, it's a good story. H.C. Morrison tells about when he was brought up uh, by his grandmother and she had him in church and it was one of those hot summer days. We didn't, they didn't have air conditioning then. And he was restless and not too interested in church, just a little boy. And he leaned over and whispered to his grandmother and says, I, I want a drink. And she says, you can't have it. And uh, he sat there a while and pretty soon he leaned over to her again and whispered, I want a drink. And she said, you can't have it. And he did it again the third time. He said, I want a drink. She said, you can't have it. And finally, he leaned over to and whispered to her and said, I'll die if I don't get a drink. She said, die then. <laughs> well, I don't know whether that's a little bit rugged or not, but uh, I, I, I've, sometimes I've been sorry that we put a drinking fountain uh, in the entryway of our church because I think sometimes the people take advantage of it. We thought it might be needful. But again, let me say, from a pretty young age, they don't need to run in and out of church. And let me give you something else here on this same point of faithful church attendance, but I suppose you've all got that set in your hearts already. Choose a spiritual church. If I was a layman and had to move, considering a job or something else, I would also consider if I could have a spiritual church to attend for my own soul and for the souls of my children. The church is going to mean a whole lot. Let me give you rule number something or another, probably about six. Have family standards. And let me say, number one, they ought to be biblical. They oughtn't to be notional. And I, I know some people have, have standards, and I'm sorry, but they're notional and uh, uh, they're, they're not going to stand the test, maybe for you and maybe for your children when they get out in life, but search the scriptures, listen to the preaching, despise not prophesying. And if you feel like you don't have enough good judgment, talk to your pastor or some godly saint, but have standards that are biblical that you can insist upon and not be ridiculous. And your children ought to know your family standards. They ought to know that you tell the truth. 
I've, I've been impressed with a rule that my son has with his two boys. He has a rule with them that if they do something that they shouldn't do, and they get to him as soon as they can and confess it out whole, there's no punishment. He talks to them about it, but there's no punishment. But if they do something and keep it from him and he finds it out, then they get a sound whipping. And, and I, I can't help but think that it's, it's a pretty good rule. Let, let the children know they can't quarrel. Uh, let, let them th th know that they have to obey, that they have to mind. These are some standards that you simply must have if you're going to save your children. If your children can talk back to you, you started them on their road to trouble and the road to hell. My, my father wasn't a Christian, <clears throat> but uh, believe me, if I'd have ever talked back like a lot of children do even in wholeness homes today, uh, well, I know I exaggerated like a little child would, but I did something pretty bad one time, at least he must have thought it was, and he, uh, uh, I, I think that he had two things, his hand and a razor strap, and I can't remember which it was, but I do remember that I went over to the neighbors afterwards and told them that I couldn't sit down on one of their chairs because I'd probably burn a hole in the seat. That was probably little exaggeration, but uh, you, you don't need very many whippets like that to remember them real well. Let me give you another extremely important rule if you want to save your children. Never let your children hear a disagreement between the parents. Now, I'm not talking about differences of opinion. I mean that quarreling. She can't go to that party. Yes, she can. I said she could. No, she can't. Yes, she can. And you've gone a long ways to turn that child into a rebel and make trouble in the home. Don't, don't ever let them uh, hear things of serious disagreement. You can disagree and discuss it privately, but you ought not to contradict one another. I like Dr. Henry Brandt's rule. He said, if at all possible, if the child goes from one to the other, let the first order stand. If mother said, this is it, don't let them go to dad and get by with it, or the other way around, if it's, if it's at all reasonable. I'd like to tell you an extreme story. I, uh, as I've, I maybe remarked, I've taught in four different Bible schools and I've had a few experiences. And I remember in one of them, we had a boy that was just a real problem. Uh, the school had mostly lady teachers. I, I taught, and I think there might have been one other man that taught, but this particular school in that particular year had mostly lady teachers. And that boy was in trouble all the time with those teachers, just all the time. And until finally, I was appointed by the faculty to go and talk to him. So I went and talked to him, and I felt sorry for him. He told me that his father had brought him up to believe you never have to obey a woman, even your mother. You never have to obey a woman. Well, look, look what he'd done to that poor boy. He was in trouble all the time in school. I don't know that he ever got settled spiritually. The last I heard, he's a grown man, has a family now. I don't suppose he settled yet. That's, that was a tragic, ridiculous thing for that man to do. Let them know that. And another rule or law is be careful of discussion before the children. I, I don't believe, not, now I don't know how you feel, but I don't believe that you need to discuss the faults and problems of others, especially in front of young children. I don't believe you do. I don't believe you need to discuss their spiritual failures. Brother Shmuel touched on this the other night, and I'd like to go over it again. If, if you run down the preacher, or the Christian workers, or whoever they are, there may come a time that that preacher or Christian worker might be God's only channel to get to your child, and he's already been taught to scoff at that spiritual leader. And there, there may have been, been no grounds for it. I, I, knew, I knew a case, I knew it all too well. They were friends, close friends, and neighbors. And I believe with all my heart that they meant to be spiritual people. But, and some of this I have to pick up, and some of it I know first, firsthand, 
But I think when they went home from church around the dinner table, they said, we're going to have spiritual children, and we're not going to let them grow up being deceived about spiritual things. And so at the dinner table, they'd say, you remember so-and-so got up and testified this morning that they got sanctified last night? Well, they really didn't. They really didn't. And you know so-and-so that got up and testified and said they got saved last week? Well, they, they really didn't. You know, they wanted their children keen to see through someone. And you, you see that woman? She testified to being saved, and her dress is at least a one thirty-second of an inch too short. She, you know I'm exaggerating to get my point across. But they did that continually until their little girl, when she was an eighth grader, You'd see her when she'd meet some woman or girl, she'd look her up and down, head to toe. And you could just see her saying, not with that hairdo, she can't be a Christian. Not with a dress like that, she can't be a Christian. Not, not with that color of a scarf around her neck, she can't be a Christian. They were trying to make keen spiritual children out of them. Do you know what happened? It was a large family, eight or nine boys and girls every one of those girls went into a life of shame. Every one of them. And every one of those boys lived a life of degradation and sin and shame, coming from a home, both parents professing to be saved and sanctified, but they made it their business to criticize everything under the name of being keen. I think it's Brother Shellhammer that said, what is it? It doesn't take an ounce of grace to criticize and only a thimble full of brains. And I, th I think he was just about right when he said that. Be careful about it. Be careful of what you discuss before your children. And you know, let me go a little bit further. And again, you know, I'm just an old grandfather and don't know a lot and forgotten some things I should have. But you know, I don't believe that you ought to sit at the table and talk about, well, I can't stand that kind of a dish for my meal. Well, I can't put up with that potatoes cooked like that or peas cooked like that or anybody that'd be so foolish as to put pepper on anything. Of course, I wouldn't put pepper on anything if you paid me for it. I can't stand the stuff. But you know, just run things down. I believe that you can so act until your children can grow up not being picky and not being finicky. And we've had company at our house that the children say, I don't like that and I don't like that. Well, they didn't like anything we had in the table and, it, and it, it was a good meal. My wife grew up in an orphanage and sometimes all they had was oatmeal. And she said uh, it was thin and soupy. And she said if they didn't eat it at one meal, they had it the next. And she just got turned against oatmeal till she, she can't eat it yet today. But our children never heard her say a word about it. And she thought the oatmeal was good for them, so she cooked oatmeal for them, and they served them oatmeal, and they all ate it under a, a glorious deception that it was good food. And I think that was all right. You, you, you don't, and can I say something else? You don't need, I mean, there's an age, I know there's an age when it changes, but you don't need to talk about how poor we are. Daddy is just a poor holiness preacher, and you children just can't have things that others have. And we're just poor people. We can't have nice things like they do. We just can't have that. I was real pleased. My, other, my boy now is in his, in his 30s, late 30s, I guess, somewhere in there, and he told me not long before he left, he said, I never knew when we were growing up that we were poor. I thank God that God helped us to live that way. We dressed them as well as we could, and my wife had a, a good stock answer when the children would come and say, but this family, they do so-and-so, and they dress so-and-so. And my wife would say, well, that's the way they do, and this is the way we do. She didn't say we were so poor that we couldn't do anything different. And you can do some things that will mold your children and help you to save them. Well, let, let me move on. Be an example. I don't suppose I'll ever forget two stories. I'll just tell them briefly and, and maybe they'll uh, get my whole point across. About the man that went into the saloon, and we've probably all read the story in a track somewhere and, and ordered a drink, and his little boy was with him in the bar 
gamekeeper just, you know, just in chest said, and what will my little man have? He said, I'll take what daddy takes and they'll do it. And they'll follow your crude or your refined manner of speech. They'll follow your slovenly or your careful manner of dress. They'll do the way you do. Be an example to your children. The other story is such a heartbreaking one. You know how little girls like to dress up in old fashioned clothes and finery and high heels and long dresses and stuff like that. One little girl did that with some of her friends one day and found some of her mother's long flimsy dresses up in the attic of another day in the high heels and she dressed up in them and she was going to be like mama. And then uh, she was going to be like mama so she got a cigarette and lighted it. And the little girl didn't know how to handle it and it caught that flimsy dress of fire. And it burned her so badly that she did die from it. But as she lay dying, she said, I tried to do what mama did and it killed me. Be an example to your children. Be an example to your children. Could I stretch that being ex an example a little bit further? Uh, I, uh, I never heard anyone else say this, but it, it struck me one time I was in a revival and I said, probably nobody in this crowd would let your children see you light up a cigarette or tip a can of beer to your mouth. You, you, you feel too serious about your example to your children. But now, I, I, I don't believe I could say that to this crowd, but I said that crowd needed it, and so I said it to them. But I said, you are setting another example to your children. Under the preaching of the word, you sit there dead and dry and inattentive. And you're setting an example to your children. When the blessing of God comes down, you're as dead and dry as can be. You're setting an example to your children. This power of example is a powerful thing. And we better be careful about how we use it on our children. We ought to walk straight and stand tall and, and dress neatly and speak as correctly as we can and have good table manners and all the rest of it. Well, I guess I'm getting out of that, into that, what do they call it, a meddling area. Let me give you another one of those. Just, just enraptured with the thrill of this oratory. I hope you are. But anyway, I like the story that uh, is told about the Wesleys. Uh, Mr. Wesley asked his wife Susanna. He said, "Why do you tell?" I think they called John Jackie when he was little. Said, "Why do you tell Jackie the same thing twenty times?" She said, "Because nineteen times is not enough." In other words, have discipline and insist on it. Stay by it. Keep it up. Uh, my boy will tell you yet the story, uh, maybe it's stories in the plural, about having to get up out of bed after he'd gone to bed and been asleep and he'd left undone something that he was supposed to do. And I told him to do it and he knew he was supposed to do it and he didn't do it. So I got him out of bed and made him do it. Well, you old meanie. But uh, he's glad today. He talks about it, and he's glad today. Uh, what do you think about this? A child should never be allowed to talk back to authority. Whether that's father or mother or older person or teacher in the school or pastor, and you won't have any trouble with the policeman problem then, but a child should never be allowed to talk back to authority. And let me go another step, and I think I mentioned this the other day, but a child should not be allowed to display its carnality. You say, uh, did, did you say get the carnality out of them? No, only God can do that. But you don't need to let them display it. They don't need to throw fits of anger. They don't need to bat their head on the floor or pound their fist on the wall or, or scream for a long time. They don't need to do it. I believe that you can handle that. And I, again, I'm, I'm not very sharp on this business of child rearing, but I, I heard about a preacher that I thought gave some good advice to some of his parish. They later became my parishioners. And they said that service after service, 
their little boy would fuss and cry until they had to take him out of church, and it embarrassed them. And one time they talked to the pastor about it, and later they became my parishioners, many years later. But that dear pastor said to them, he said to them, if you'd paddled him right, you wouldn't have to do it again. And I guess they started out doing that, and I've had them in church, and I had uh, another child that came along, and they never gave a bit of trouble. You can handle them. Now, children act on, uh, what do you call it, punishments and rewards. And if screaming will get them the reward of a pleasant back and forth walking out in the cool air outside of the church, why shouldn't they scream? They might just as well, because they like that you know, walking back and forth and enjoying it. But if when they scream, they go outside and get a paddling that, that they remember for a long time, they'll put two and two together real quick and they say, it doesn't pay to scream. And they'll quit it. They, they'll learn. I'm not talking about those times of illness or something like that, but I'm talking about those times when you know it's, it's temper and, and temper that's unhandled. And you say, you're not getting in a very spiritual area today. I'm getting in an area where it's too late for some of you, but it's not too late for some of you young people that have children that are growing up. If you want to save them for home and the church and God, take care of it right now. And you can. God has given you the authority to do that. This real discipline, a real love, means real discipline. I cannot go this modern, I, I don't know what it is, psychology or whatever the stuff is, and I saw it illustrated one time that was just pretty near too much for me to take. A mo now, a mother was holding her little boy in her arms, so you know he wasn't too big, and he reached up and slapped her a good one on the face, just slapped, just meanness. And she said, I was there, I saw this. She said, now the reason probably he did that, I think it was uh, about three or four days ago, I think it was on Tuesday, he wanted to do something and I didn't let him do it and now his anger is getting out. Can you think of anything more ridiculous than that? I stood there and saw that very thing take place. My children never did that, but if they had, you all know already what would have happened. It would have had. Now, now let, let, me, let me get a little scripture backing for this. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now, that's the inspired word of God. But he that loveth him chasteneth him. This is sad. Chasten thy son while there's hope. Doesn't always last. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. This is one of the places I'm inclined to agree with Bill Gothard. You ought not to use your hand to whip your child. Use, my father had one of those wide razor straps. They don't have them anymore. But you can roll up a newspaper or you can take a switch. Uh, you're, you're not out to injure that child. You're out to handle them. And again, can this old grandfather tell you something else? If it takes you five hours to do it, stay by it until you've handled it. Until you've ha it might be three little swats with a willow switch, and you know that that child has been conquered. It might take a longer time. I saw uh, an extremely busy businessman one time just on his way to work personal friend of mine and Brother Smooth's, and that man was on his way to work, and his little daughter, just a little thing, disobeyed. I don't know what it was. It was a pretty small thing, because she's a pretty nice little child. But she disobeyed, and he spoke to her, and she didn't mind. He had important business in the city that he should get to, but that godly man knew enough. He stopped and took time with that little girl and dealt with her a little bit of whipping, I don't mean to injure them, but a little bit of whipping, a little bit of admonishing, not handled yet, a little more whipping, a little more admonishing, not handled yet, keep it up, don't get tired, this is your business as a parent. And he stayed by it until that little thing threw her arms around his neck and cried and loved him and the thing was handled. 
I had the happy privilege of being the preacher when that child, before she was five years old, asked her daddy one time back in the seat, she said, can I go to the altar? Well, he said, well, sure. And he said, do you want me to go with you? And she said, no. And that little thing, not yet five, came to the altar. And she prayed and she cried. And of course, we gathered around her and prayed with her. And I finally said, uh, did Jesus come into your heart? She said, not yet. <laughs> and she kept it up and wept and prayed. And you know, I think she's a born again Christian, that little child today. But some of it goes back to parents that would not let a disobedience get by. I sure hope that I'm well loved, but I don't know whether I am or not. <clears throat> Withhold, this, now this is the word of God. Withhold not correction from the child. For, for, isn't this an amazing statement? For if thou beatest him with the rod, he won't die. It isn't going to kill him. It's just going to make him a better boy or make her a better girl. The rod and the reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Th th these, thi these things are sad. We, we must discipline our children if we want to save them for a home, for God and the church. They'll be glad for it someday. Now let me say something else. I, I'd like to say a lot more, but I, I will draw the line sometime here this morning. But one thing about this discipline is be firm, stay by it until you've handled it, and be consistent. Don't slap them the side of the head one day and through th three days let them get by with the same thing. Children are pretty smart. Our little boy had a habit of almost always coming to the table without washing his hands. And of course, my wife would say, go back and wash your hands before you can eat. So he'd go wash his hands and come back. Next day, he'd do it again, come without his hands washed. She'd say, go back and wash your hands. What I'm saying is be consistent. Children know when you aren't. And one day she said to him, she said, why would you come to the table without your hands washed when you know that I'll send you back to wash them? Well, he said, you might forget sometime. <laughs> Pretty smart, aren't they? Pretty smart. He thought that she might forget sometime. Well, she didn't. Let me give you something else. And I'll have to say this. I wasn't as good at this as I should have been. But God bless my dear wife. She was good at it. And that is keep the communication channels open between you and your children all the time until whatever they get into, they can come to you and know. They may know that you'll be displeased, but they'll also know that you love them. Uh, just keep those communication chapel, uh, channels open every bit of the time. I, I'm sure we've all been impressed with the story of Mrs. Wesley giving her children uh, an hour, every one of them during the week. Didn't she have 21 children? I don't believe they all lived at one time. Uh, another thing, never punish them in anger. Uh, this world doesn't have much sense. I read an article that said, if you have to punish your children, be angry when you do it until you get it across. Well, you know what that's doing? That's just handling the carnality in the child by turning loose the carnality in you. That, that, that's no way to act. Do like I did when I whipped my boy. Pray, pray with him, talk with him, talk it over, and tell them. So keep the communication channels open with your children all the time, and let them know this. When it's handled and they're forgiven, you never bring it up again. You never bring it up again. That's the way God handles us, and that's the way that we ought to handle our children. There's so much more that I would like to say, but I think that uh, I've got something here that I'd like to read to you, and I, I do want to give that. But keeping this communication channel open to your children, I'd like to tell you a little story, that, or a couple little stories that kind of uh, get through to my heart. That's feel the responsibility of your children's souls. And I remember my dear wife one time when our youngest, the one I hope to see here tomorrow, I hope she'll be here. She was just a little baby. I don't know how much she could even understand. 
But my wife got rather warm in her heart about the experience of holiness that God had given her. And she took our little daughter, that little baby, and set her up on the counter in the kitchen and testified to her for 45 minutes telling her how the Lord sanctified her. Well, why are you laughing at me? It might have done her good. Probably did my wife good. It might have affected the child. Keep channels open there between you and your children. Keep, uh, keep talking the things of God. Let that be precious. I'd like to tell you another story, and this I'll be brief with, but it's so heartwarming to me. I suppose it would be a wonder if I didn't almost weep this morning when I told it. But I remember one time, this is many years ago, we lived in a little house, and to try and get the picture. You came in the back door here, you came onto a porch, and then you came to the kitchen. And the kitchen was small, all of our kitchens have been small, and even in the truck box it was pretty small. And uh, then there was a living room, and then there was a little hallway, and the clear the other side of the room was my study. And my wife was standing in the kitchen door, and I was standing in my study door. And uh, we were talking about the things of God, clear across the house like that. Children were there in the house. We were talking about the things of God. And uh, actually what we were talking about right at the moment was uh, the time when the Lord sanctified me. And that's always a kind of a... That's kind of a high point in my life to talk about that. And brethren, I'm just telling you the truth just like it happened. We were clear apart in the house there. And my wife was just speaking something about when I got sanctified. And it was just like a cloud or a wind of God's presence just swept through the house from my wife to me clear across that house. Just swept until we both just stood there in awe. Just, just stood there in awe, sensing that presence of God. And our oldest child, who was in the middle room and was still a pretty young child, just after that presence had swept through the room, she turned to her mother and she said, Mama, I felt that. But I tell you, things like that are going to do something for your children. They'll never forget as, as long as they live. And that's what this scripture said that I read to you. Talk of it when you walk by the way and when you sit down, when you rise up and when you eat and when you journey and all the rest of it. I'd like to take some time to tell you about what I think are some promises of God, not that guarantee that he'll, what shall I say, override the will of your children, but they're promises of God to encourage us that we can bring the whole family in. I'd like to. I've got a dozen of them, but I'm just going to give you one. One of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament, in the Exodus 12, where the Lord is commanding the children of Israel to save their house by getting them under the blood. And you remember there were several things qualified. A lamb must be slain, but that did not save them. That did not protect them. The lamb's blood must be shed, but that did not protect them. The lamb's blood must be applied on the doorpost and the lintel of the house, but that was not enough. They had to be in that house that was covered by the blood. They had to be in that house that was covered by the blood, and then they were safe, the destroying angel passed over them. And this is the verse that I want to give to you, and I think it's so beautiful. When the Lord was giving those directions, he said to the children of Israel, take your lamb for a house and go through the ceremony and, and all the rest of it. And then he said something that is so beautiful to me. He said, and if the lamb is too big for the house, bring someone else in. He didn't say the lamb might be too small for some house, but he said it's pretty liable to be too big for a house. And brethren, I think that's saying to us, there's room under the shed blood of the Lamb of God to bring them all in. No house too big. Uh, you know that I'm not teaching that God will, without a man's will, save him. But I am saying, and I'd like to take time to run through 
the scriptures, the many promises there are that almost seem to guarantee that God is extremely interested in bringing the whole family into heaven. I, I want to read you something, and I suppose maybe some of you are familiar with it. I asked Brother Sutherland, I said, uh, is your crowd familiar with this little passage that I'd like to read? And he said he didn't think so. And it won't take me long to read it, and you'll still be to dinner on time, but I am going to ask you this. Uh, it's the story of what's called Kitty's Rebellion. And if the most of you are familiar with it, I'm not going to read it, because I don't like to read to people. How many of you are familiar with the story of Kitty's Rebellion? I know that at least there's some here because they've been in church when I've read it. That's not the most of you. Uh, will you really be good to me if I read to you? I literally hate to read to people because they nod their heads and they look out the window and they chew their pencil and they don't pay attention. But this will do you good to listen to the story of Kitty's Rebellion and you'll know that I'm sacrificing something because I hate to read it loud to people. I just hate to, but this is good. Let me read it to you and I'll read as fast as I can. See if you got get any message in this. <clears throat> Evidently written after this girl was 70, or I mean 18, 19 years old. One sultry summer afternoon, some 17 years ago, Kitty ran in from play for a drink of cool lemonade which stood in the table. Please, Mama, said her mother as she turned the glass. Kitty can't say please, replied the little maid. Now Kitty had said please a hundred times and usually delighted in saying everything she was told. She quite reveled in conversational powers for a year and a half old. For the first time in her short life, she had taken a notion that she would not do as she was bid. So her mother set the glass down again untasted, and the child ran back to her doorstep as thirsty, and, as, thirsty as before. But it was very warm, and presently the little feet came pattering back and the thirsty lips were put up again for a drink. Kitty say please? Can't say please. So the baby went away thirsty again. This experiment was repeated perhaps a dozen times in the course of the afternoon. At first playfully as it seemed, but as the wee rebel began actually to suffer from heat and thirst, rather than say please, it became a rather serious question how long she would hold out. Please, mama, lift Kitty, said the mother gently. Instantly, the eager little face fell. Baby shook her head, muttered, can't say please, and turned away. Her father and mother and the rest of the children sat down at the table, but who could eat supper while that poor little outlaw stood back by the wall, moaning with hunger and thirst? The mother rather yearned to take her in her arms and give her food and drink, but how could she? The little one knew that one dutiful word would bring her all she wanted, yet she refused to speak it. And I know enough to know many a mother would have given in at this point. The question was fairly at issue. Should the child obey the parent or the parent submit to the child? It is an old and common dilemma, and in thousands of households, the child carries the day. But Mrs. Hart did not believe God meant that to be the order of the world. So she took her baby to her room and set before her very tenderly and seriously her naughty behavior. She knelt down and prayed the Savior to make her good and obedient. But after it all, Kitty could not say please any better than before. At length, distressed and tired out and fairly alarmed at the little creature who had not tasted drink since noon, she carried her to her father and begged him to take the case in hand. Mr. Hart began to talk with the young culprit playfully, nothing doubting he should soon bring her round. He gave her a great many words to speak, which she did all very readily, till fatal please came along that she could not do. Year and a half old understood very well that to say that was to submit. So he grew serious and told her that he should have to whip her if she did not mind. Now Kitty and whipping were two things never thought of in the same breath before. She had always been an uncommonly sweet and gentle child, 
and nobody had ever guessed how much grit was latent in that soft little bosom. Nothing else would avail, however, and the whipping had to come. Still, the baby remained stout-hearted and far from righteousness. Little, 18-month-old, ought to let her have her way. No, no, I don't think so. Feverish and exhausted, with parched lips crying for drink, yet inflexibly refusing to speak the little word which would bring it, she was put to bed in her crib. All through the warm night she tossed and moaned in her unquiet sleep, or woke crying from thirst. But even then, sleepy and miserable as she was, she could only sob, can't say please, when the water came near. For the father and mother, that was a night of sleepless wretchedness, relieved only by prayer. They really began to fear that the child would sooner die than give up. Oh, Shaw, never mind the please, give her a drink, many a father would have said. Poor little thing, I must let the minding go till another time, most mothers would have thought. But Mr. and Mrs. Hart did not see it so. If it was like death for a will to yield after 18 months' growth, what would it be like after months and years of indulgence? God had committed to them this soul of his creating to be trained for himself. If she could not be made to obey her father whom she had seen, how should she become obedient to her father in heaven whom she had not seen? The very fact that her will was so strong made it the more imperative to their minds that it should be brought under control of her conscience. They saw what a cruel tyrant it would prove if left to hold sway. The longer the struggle was protracted, the more likely it seemed that the result would be a final one and the more important that it should be right. Then the other children who had been watching this new phase of family history with a kind of solemn dread, should they learn that the authority they had been taught to revere could after all be trodden under the feet of a baby? It would not do. It had been clearly explained to the little one that it was her heavenly father's command that she would obey her parents and that she was resisting his will. The father and mother felt that they had no right to annul his law. So the night wore away and the morning broke, but it brought no peace to the household, weighed down by the perverseness of its young rebel. She woke worn and almost sick, but stubborn as ever. Free will, indeed, what a grand, awful mystery it is. How shrined in a dainty, delicate morsel of flesh it can look out and defy the world. What wonder heaven and earth contended for little Kitty's will. So they do for everyone. Happy the child whose parents steadfastly keep the right side in the conflict. Kitty found an ally in the morning, a woman in the adjoining tenement, having learned the state of the things from the children, came in to plead for her. She assured Mrs. Hart that she was killing the child, that it was downright cruelty to treat her so, that if she had a little girl, she would never see her suffer when she could help it. All this fell on a sore and aching heart. The mother had already been tormented with fears that the heat and thirst and excitement would really be the death of her poor, naughty little darling. She tried to think up some compromise by which Kitty could be relieved without a sacrifice of parental government. At last, she quietly placed a mug of milk in a low chair and left the little girl alone in the room while the father and mother watched her unseen. They saw her hands come up to the mug and press her hot little hands against its cool sides and begin to raise it to her thirsty lips. Then, suddenly, she set it down with a piteous look and went away moaning. It was a cruel battle between honor and desire for such a little heart. Again and again the little creature would come up and look wistfully into the mug of white milk, shake her head mournfully, and turn away. Kitty would not slink out of the difficulty if her parents would let her. She must openly surrender. This display of character made it clearer to them than ever that they should break down the demands of her conscience. In the course of the morning, Mrs. Hart was relieved to see the family physician drive up to the door. She hastened to tell him the whole story and ask whether she was risking 
too much. He advised her to put it through. The little thing couldn't hold out much longer. Moreover, straightway the doctor conceived a little stratagem to bring her to terms. It was a great treat for any of the children to ride with him and one to which Kitty had never yet arrived. So when he proposed to take her this morning, she flushed up with delight and capered about the room in high glee. Run, ask your mother to please put on your hat then, said the doctor. Instantly the bright little face faded. She had lost all desire to go if there was a please to it. So that expedient failed. It was getting towards noon, <coughs> nearly 24 hours during which Kitty had not tasted food or drink and still wandered about the house, a wan little object, often crying, but obstinate as ever. Almost heartbroken to see her so, the mother took her in her arms once more and carried her to her chamber. Once again, she showed the little girl how wretched her willfulness was making herself <clears throat> and all the rest, and how it was grieving the dear Savior. Then she knelt and with strong crying and tears, implored the blessed spirit who can meet every heart to subdue the stubborn will. Suddenly, the baby threw her arms around her neck and burst out, please, 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 please. The grateful mother covered her with tears and kisses and carried her down to the sitting room where she sprang into her father's arms crying, please, 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 as if she would never be done. Now she was all radiant with love and peace. The other children came running in to hear how Kitty could say please. She was ready to hug and kiss everybody. The whole family stood around laughing and crying to see her drink her cup of milk and hardly able to let her alone long enough to do it. The house was full of joy. The battle had ended. Right had triumphed. It had been a terrible struggle, but it was once for all. From that day to this, Kitty Hart has shown no disposition to resist rightful authority. God bless the parents that have that sense and courage. Am I the man that has to tell you you can go after listening this long? I think you listen pretty good. Thank you. And may God help you and me to be preachers that we can save our children, to be parents that will work scripturally to save our children, and our churches are going to grow and glow with the glory of God when they're filled with people that have been taught to obey Daddy and Mother and their Savior in heaven. God bless you. You're dismissed.